And thank you for the invitation to be here to talk with you about a topic that I am extremely passionate about and have been working on for about the last five years. Um, I went to graduate school at the University of Washington where I discovered a passion for citizen science and found myself working for the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team. So that's what COAST stands for. It's not a typo. There are two S's there. Um, and it's my pleasure to talk with you today about kind of the big picture of marine debris in, in the ocean environment. Um, what it is, how much we know is out there, um, where, it, where it is, and what the impacts are. And then I'm going to tell you more specifically about what COAST is doing to tackle the questions that are still remaining um, here locally. So I want to start with a basic definition of marine debris, uh, just so we're all on the same page about what I'm talking about. So marine debris is defined by the NOAA Marine Debris Program as any persistent solid material manufactured or processed directly or indirectly, intentionally or in unintentionally disposed or abandoned into the marine environment. Uh, and about, depending on what scientist you talk to, 70 to 90 percent of that kind of man-processed stuff that winds up in the marine environment is plastic. So it's reasonable to talk about it as marine plastics. Um, and of course, plastics are per fit that keyword of persistent. So they are polymers made out of many monomers into very uh, tough chains that have carbon to carbon bonds that are really hard to break. And they're relatively new in the environment for bacteria to try to tackle and break apart, and they're just not very good at it. Um, until recently, we thought they didn't do it at all. Uh, and there are a few exceptions um, that have been noticed uh, more recently, uh, although we don't expect that bacteria are going to solve the problem and um, biodegrade everything that's out there. So instead of biodegrading, they break down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, and there are a ton out there. And as far as um, kind of the use of the plastics that we find in the marine environment, about 33% are from single use. So those are things like plastic bottles, um, plastic bags, food containers, the things that we use once and then throw away. Um, in Puget Sound, we also have a lot of signs of the timber industry and maritime industry, uh, and those are kind of things that we're seeing at a really local level. So the most obvious stuff is what we call macro debris. This is really clear with the naked eye. Um, some of it can be traced back to its particular origins. Things like a large dock that washed up um, following the tsunami in Japan in 2011. Uh, one washed up here in the Olympic on the Olympic Peninsula in Olympic National Park. Another in Newport, Oregon. Um, so big stuff that gets a lot of public attention. Uh, also kind of consumer sized stuff like um, plastic bottles. Some of these larger things pose a risk uh, to to boaters uh, and that as a navigation hazard um, and pose a risk for collision. Um, but then more and more we're talking about micro debris, microplastics. And so although macro debris is big, it's obvious we see it, we can pick it up and clean it. Microplastics exist in orders and orders of magnitude more in terms of quantity. So um, some of it is intended to be that small. Those are things like nurdles, which are those, um, if you see the image on the left, they're pre-production pellets of uh, plastic that are later injection molded into any number of things that we might use. So that's sort of the raw materials of plastic. Uh, other things that are intentionally made to be small, uh, microplastic, microbeads in cosmetics, so uh, these were banned in 2017 at the national level, and they're being phased out. So that's a positive for legislation. Um, 
and then, of course, things that break apart into smaller and smaller pieces. And I'm going to pass around an example so you all can see what nurdles look like and what some fragments look like if you never had before. I see these a lot more on the outer coast of Washington and in, in Oregon than I do here in Puget Sound. Um, so that tells us that at least our industry isn't um, posing a source of nurdles. The other one is microfibers, and these probably make up the vast majority of microplastics. Uh, I have a statistic here, which is that 1,900 microfibers, which are synthetic polyester, nylon, and acrylic, um, they're rinsed into our water from a single wash of a shirt or a fleece. So the volume is just unbelievable. Uh, and they aren't caught in the wastewater treatment process. So the mesh that's used to catch things um, in wastewater treatment before they make their way into uh, streams and rivers and effluent uh, doesn't catch those. So microbeads and, and microfibers are just being released daily. So the latest estimate of the amount of plastic that's in the environment globally is 4.8 to 12.7 million metric tons of plastic annually. So just let that sit for a second. It's kind of hard to visualize. So the analogy is that it's enough to cover the entire coastline, the, the coastline of the entire world with plastic garbage bags filled. And it's estimated that about 10% of plastic that's produced annually does make its way into the ocean. And studies show that countries like China and Indonesia are the greatest contributors, but the, the United States has no small part. We're, we're a significant contributor as well. Here in Puget Sound, the top items that we see are listed here. So primarily consumer type single use plastics, bottles, um, shotgun wads and shells, mostly from waterfowl hunting is, is my guess, um, food wrappers, and then construction materials associated uh, with the maritime industry. And after 4th of July, fireworks as well. So I wanna talk a second about distribution and transport. So the currents of the ocean connect us globally, uh, and therefore marine debris is not distributed evenly throughout the ocean. Um, it's dependent on the sources, the hotspot sources, so where things are released most predominantly, and then, of course, the way that currents move um, concentrates things around um, areas of convergence. Marine debris exists in sediments throughout the water column, in polar ice, and only a small portion is floating at the surface in a visible way. And the Arctic ice discovery is relatively recent and really emphasizes that even in places where people aren't living, uh, the signature of our, of our way of life makes its way. So folks have probably heard about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. It's a bit of a misnomer. Uh, it's not really a patch that you can just go stand in the middle of the ocean and see. In fact, uh, most of it is the microplastics that we talked about. Uh, you could boat right through the garbage patch and not see anything. Um, and, but you can, it has raised a lot of public interest and attention to this idea that um, ocean currents concentrate debris in particular areas called gyres. And the North Pacific gyre, which is west of our coast, is the nearest one and it's the most famous one. But there are five in the world's oceans. And we can think of them sort of as a big swirling whirlpool of currents um, that's pulling objects in, pulling stuff in, and concentrating it at the center. But it's not a single kind of, you can't take a GPS point, it's not a static thing. Um, as 
weather and climate changes and with seasons and so forth, um, this region, which is very large, moves. And it doesn't contain a lot of floating debris that's large. I mentioned um, it's mostly small stuff, and that's because wind also plays a role in where and when debris occurs. And things that sit high in the water, floating debris, has uh, more wind to, uh, is more susceptible to wind action. And so we call this windage. Here's a diagram that shows that items that sit high in the water and have a larger surface area for wind to act on, um, their trajectory and their speed are, are more influenced by wind. And oceanographers have uh, figured out a way to use this information about an object in addition to um, how big it is and um, either where it started in time in a place or where it ends up to forecast and hindcast the path that things take. So if we know where and when something left a particular place and we know the windage of it and we know something about the currents and the wind in between here and there, we can estimate where and when it will wind up on our shores. In reverse, if we know where and when something landed on our shore and we have information about the windage and the preceding currents and winds with some degree of accuracy, we can estimate where and when it came from and what path it took to get here. And a prime example of that is uh, the tsunami of Tohoku in 2011 in Japan. So obviously this, this event caused a ton of public media attention. Um, it was a huge human tragedy uh, and it brought a lot of concern around the different impacts of debris. Um, it also provided an opportunity in the same way that like oceanographers have used drift cards for eons to, to map um, ocean movement and that we had this point in time and place where tons of debris were washed out to the ocean and we were able to test our models about where and when things would wash up here. It only took six months um, for our stuff to start crossing 4,000 miles of the Pacific Ocean and a cool video to show you. So what you see here is starting in 2011 the stuff that is highest windage came to us fastest. And so that's stuff in red. And then over the next few years, it kind of dissipated and got sucked into the gyre. And the highest windage stuff went, wound up at the South Pole. So this is looping. So this allows us, uh, this kind of work allows us to estimate, again, um, what we're seeing on our beaches, where did it come from? And in the reverse, uh, when people are beach combing in China and in Japan, they're seeing our marine debris and, and it's all connected again with those, via those currents. So on the whole, important, where does it come from? I think there's a tendency to wanna think that it, it's all coming from over there or out there, out in the ocean. Uh, but the truth is that about 80% comes from land. And that's through a variety of sources, including litter, beachgoers on site leaving things, um, those fireworks that I mentioned, uh, illegal dumping, um, but also stormwater discharge. So if you put your tote out on garbage day and it's over full and people keep adding to it and maybe the crows come along and pick something out and then or it dumps over because of high wind. Um, things blow off into a storm drain, make their way to a creek, to a river, out into the ocean, and it's gone. And in some parts of the world where they don't have garbage day, that happens a lot more frequently. Uh, another one, uh, so poor waste management. I think uh, you could consider that if, uh, intentional dumping in rivers, and that is the way that that some places handle, uh, handle their waste. 
Um, but another is things like we weren't thinking about microplastics when we designed our wastewater treatment, and so we're releasing those microfibers and microbeads out into the environment, and we need to we need to be thinking about ways to engineer both the prevention in our clothing and in the materials that we use and also in the processes. Um, and then natural disasters like tsunamis. Stuff in the ocean, uh, which is the minority and it's illegal uh, uh, to dump at sea, uh, but it does happen. So fishing vessels, uh, lost fishing gear. I mean, that's one that gets a lot of attention because it, fishing gear, nets, ropes, hooks, lines, and so forth, that stuff continues to fish and catch animals beyond its intentional lifespan. That's called ghost fishing. Um, but there's also, uh, in a major storm, if you're on a boat, you could lose some shipping containers or some gear or waste. And then I've put uh, cruise ships up there with a question mark because it's not a documented source. But the more I spend time on beaches and study this uh, and talk to folks who beach comb a lot, the more it seems like there might be some indicators that, uh, whether intentionally or not, cruise ships um, may be a source. So in addition to those oceanographic models that I mentioned and the different factors that feed into it, like windage and the size of an object, there are a number of different characteristics of items that we use in Coast to kind of perform CSI on where something came from. So there's, there's these different clues. Not every object has all of these things, but in concert, they can tell us something. So we look at things like, well, what the heck is it? Does it have a logo or brand, um, foreign language? Barcodes can tell us where and when something was sold. Uh, and then biofouling, so if there are organisms growing on or in the stuff that we find, are those organisms native to our region? If they're not, can we identify where they're from? That could tell us that it at least spent time in that place. So just a handful of examples here. We've got a rubber ducky that clearly has spent some time uh, in the marine environment. Uh, and we have a fishing tote on the, on the bottom right there that was found by participants in our program in Northern Oregon uh, from uh, that what, we have some translation volunteers that help us identify foreign brands and languages and do some research into what we can find out. Uh, and they discovered that this is from the Ofuco uh, fishing plant, uh, fish processing plant that was in the, in the footprint of the tsunami. And so the before and after photos on Google Earth, you can see there was this big factory, this, this plant beforehand, and it's completely gone now. And so we've got the, the brand there and the location, and then we also found that the species that are growing on this uh, tote, which you can't see super well, but there's some mussels, um, so these are, are Japanese species of mussels. So there's a few signatures out there. Okay, so we've talked about how much globally, that what the estimates of how much is out there, um, generally what the sources are and kind of how marine debris is distributed throughout the world. Um, and those are really important things to know if we're gonna consider prevention and removal. So. Um, what are the greatest sources or what are the greatest locations? What are the hotspots? Where do I want to do a beach cleanup? Um, where do I want to focus on preventing debris from getting into the environment? Um, but we also need to consider impacts because there's a lot out there. Plastic's not going away anytime soon. So if we focus on the worst bad stuff, that might make things a little more manageable. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about what we know as far as the impacts are, um, and then what we're trying to do at a local level to identify quantity, source, location, and potential impacts. So I already mentioned biofouling. 
Uh, the tsunami brought a lot of attention to the concern for introduction of invasive species. So hitchhiking organisms that make their way like those mussels did to our shores. If they survive and do well, they reproduce, they could become the next green crab of the Puget Sound or the Pacific coast of Washington. So that, uh, that dock that I mentioned that washed up on the Olympic Peninsula, it had over 200 different species that were still alive on it. So they made that 4,000 mile journey over the course, over like a year. I think this, it washed up in December of 2012. Um, and so those ocean model predictions, uh, in addition to people on the ground and eyes and ears out there, are re were really helpful for figuring out, okay, where is this thing gonna make landfall? Where and when are things making landfall? Rapid detection, rapid response, fire blasting that thing to prevent those organisms from making a home here. So that's something we continue to look for. Impacts to wildlife. So entanglement is a great concern for uh, not just these beautiful charismatic megafauna, but 135 species of invertebrates, fish, seabirds, sea turtles, seals, sea lions, dolphins, and whales have been documented uh, to be impacted by entanglement. In Washington um, and in the North Pacific Northwest in general, northern fur seals, um, monk seals, and sea turtles are um, kind of the most, the most documented. And those are, of course, species that um, have historically been in decline and whose recovery may be inhibited by these kinds of interactions. And as far as whales are concerned, uh, documentation of entanglement has been in the on the rise in the last few years. So I've introduced something here called characteristics. And this is key to Coast's approach to documenting marine debris in the environment. So we look at the things that tell us about the potential source, like those clues I outlined, and things that tell us about potential impact, like floppy, loopy, likely to pose an entanglement risk, yes. Uh, and it's not just things like fishing gear that I've shown here, but there are all kinds of other things that we make um, that share those characteristics and pose a risk for, of entanglement. Um, six pack holder ring holders are kind of the obvious poster case, but I see a lot of um, construction site fencing, that orange stuff that looks and functions exactly like a net. It wasn't made for that purpose, but for whatever reason, it winds up in the marine environment and poses the same risk. Oh yeah, yeah, if you get your Christmas tree wrapped. Ingestion is the hot topic right now. Uh, so I, this is a headline just from this last week. You folks probably saw it. 90 pounds of plastic uh, in a single whale. Um, but it's not, again, just those huge uh, megafauna that we care so much about but it starts at the bottom of the food chain with zooplankton uh, to fish, to shellfish, seabirds, turtles, marine mammals. And then the, op the question that uh, I think is on everybody's minds is what are the human health impacts and how, how is it making its way to us? So for animals, there are two pathways uh, that ingestion causes harm. One, uh, the obvious one I think that we were thinking about for a, lot of t a long time is the physical. So you eat a whole bunch of plastic and if it's sharp, it could perforate your innards and obviously that kind of physical injury is not gonna bode well for your health. Uh, and then you can also eat a whole bunch of plastic, feel full, stop eating stuff that's actually nutritious because you think that you've you're, you feel full, and uh, eventually die of malnutrition. The other is chemical exposure. 
plastics themselves have are, are made of chemicals, but they also, uh, in the process of producing plastic, there are all kinds of additives, plasticizers that give plastic all the qualities that we look for, flexibility, uh, moldability, hardness, softness, and so forth. And many of those themselves are toxins. The other piece is that they act as sponges in the marine environment where they can adsorb ambient pollutants in the water and hold on to them and then release them to organisms during the digestive process. So animals are attracted to uh, debris uh, actively. They select for certain things. So not all items are equal in terms of their likelihood to pose a risk. Uh, one is items that look like their prey. If they use eyesight, if, if their way of recognizing a place to eat, a thing to eat, is based on what it looks like, and, but they don't have great eyesight, um, they might mistake uh, a piece of plastic for their typical prey. Another, a recent study showed that olfactory, or the smell of stuff, is also important. And I'm gonna pass around uh, an evidence of that. So it's shown that certain plastics in that adsorption of other mo molecules, they absorb smell, scent. And if they have floated through an area that had that animal's prey, a particular animal's prey, it, it takes on the scent of it, it can be a, basically a decoy. It's a bait and switch uh, for birds. And the other is that if there's actually fouling organisms that an animal wants to eat, it may peck at that item to get the gooseneck barnacle and then inadvertently also ingest plastic. So uh, styrofoam is a really classic, I mean, a very obvious example of this. And if you find yourself on the beach looking at styrofoam that, that's still intact enough to be able to do this to, um, you'll notice that there are bite marks on about 80% of styrofoam out there. So I'm just gonna pass these around as well. It kind of looks like a, a puncture wound. So the, this one here, these two actually have chunks out of them where the foam has been removed and ingested. Um, but if you look closely, you'll also see these kind of divots where the beak has poked into the foam. And like I said, about 80, some research has shown that about 80% of foam out there has evidence of this. I guess the, the fourth bullet point that I didn't put up is just dumb and curious. <laughs> and it certainly applies to gulls. Um, they might just be testing. Oh, one, there's one other theory too. And that's uh, that, it that foam may resemble bones which are uh, probably one of the only sources of calcium that birds have. Uh, and so they may be pecking at it thinking that they're gonna get some calcium. So I wanna dive into a couple examples. Uh, so many folks may have seen images like this or be familiar with the Laysan albatross. It has become uh, a species a uh, kind of a poster species for this issue of ingestion. They nest uh, in the Hawaiian Islands and one of their main breeding areas is the Midway Atoll, where it has been documented that not only are adults feeding on plastic, but they're giving it to their chicks. And they select certain items. They have preference for items that are kind of in the red uh, end of the color spectrum because that resembles their prey. So you can see on the left there, on the very top, uh, lower left image on the very top is a squid body. So that's their preferred food. And then you've got two lighters below that. And again, if you didn't have really great eyesight, you could see how you might confuse one for the other. 
They also eat fish eggs, and there are uh, little styrofoam plastic pellets resemble that. So do nurdles uh, and other small things. And I had a student a couple of years ago uh, did her capstone project with me looking at ingestion of plastics by albatross. So similar to like owls, if you've ever dissected an owl pellet, uh, for the non-digestible stuff that an albatross eats to the extent that it can, it will regurgitate that into what's called a bolus. And so at least for the adults, um, a lot of this stuff doesn't actually get stuck. Although we, there are carcasses like this seen all over the islands. Chicks are more susceptible. Um, and so she looked at a whole bunch of different boluses just to see what had been selected. And I have one of those, uh, the plastic contents of that to pass around so you can see what one uh, fledging chick consumed. And it's interesting to try to look closely and see if you can figure out what the heck those things are. There's definitely little bits of rope uh, and, and fibers that have been torn apart in addition to fragments of plastic. Another example of uh, what we kind of refer to as prey mimicry uh, it happens with sea turtles. So they preferentially, uh, when they're in a carnivorous phase of their life, go after jellyfish. That's, that's a favorite food. And all kinds of things in the marine environment that are plastic resemble a jellyfish. Again, if you don't have fabulous eyesight, um, things that undulate in the water are sort of clear to whitish. Um, so plastic bags, obvious one, but all kinds of other films and balloons. Balloons are the number one type of plastic found, or plastic bags are the number one type of plastic found in their stomachs. So that's the big critters that are intentionally, uh, in many cases, feeding on plastic. But there are filter feeders who are also passively ingesting plastic, um, so mussels, uh, humpback whales, <laughs> uh, uh, baleen whales of any kind, um, any animal that, that just feeds passively um, by ingesting volumes of water and then filtering any kind of particle out of that. So on the left, what you see is uh, some, some a, a primary example of what had been brought up in, in the water, a lot of different little pieces of plastic, almost nano-sized, so not even visible to the human eye. And then the stuff that they're supposed to be eating on the right, so plankton, um, diatoms, little guys. So regardless of your vision, if it's in the water, you're going to get these. And the really, really active area of research on this topic is about chemical exposure. So, and this has implications for human health. And there are many ways that folks are studying this. The, the primary one is through lab experiments with model organisms. Um, like this little guy on the left is called a rotifer. It's actually the smallest animal uh, known, to, known to mankind. Uh, and they're filter feeders. And some researchers fed them nanoparticles, so the teeniest particles of plastic out there, uh, of polystyrene, so styrofoam. Uh, and found that not only were those plastic particles able to enter the cells of these organisms, but when they did so, they left the door open, uh, allowing for other pollutants, other toxins to gain access to the cells. So the, the nanoparticles damage the cell wall, or sorry, not the cell wall, those are plants, uh, cell membrane. Uh, so the protective wall around a cell, they damage it, gain access, and then that damage allows these other toxins to also enter. And the result is that basically when they exposed these organisms to those other pollutants, it took 50% less concentration of those things to kill them. So 
kind of scary. Um, another example, oysters. So we don't eat rotifers, uh, but we do eat oysters. And the recent study that looked at this found that ingestion of plastic, which happens ambiently, naturally, um, when it's in their environment, results in smaller eggs, sperm that's less motile, and that second generations of oysters that had been exposed to nanoplastics uh, grew to be smaller in size. So that indicates not only individual level impacts, like your gut getting perforated or feeling full, but the potential for population level changes. Um, and then the other way folks are looking at this with other organisms is through necropsies. So if we cut open a dead bird, is there plastic in there? And then if we look at the tissues of that bird, can we see evidence of plastic molecules? And the answer is yes. Uh, there's evidence of uh, adsorption, the release of plastic chemicals and, and the persistent organic pollutants that plastics have adsorbed getting released out into the bird through the digestive process and then being absorbed into the adipose tissue or fat. Uh, so the dots haven't quite been connected yet between um, what's happening in these organisms and what the implications are for people, um, but it's not looking good. And I think the precautionary principle is probably the, the way to go on this one. And of course, uh, if that's not enough uh, to get you feeling concerned and depressed, uh, and you're more concerned with the economic <laughs> effects of plastic, it's, they're big. So I mentioned already boating hazards. Um, so hitting deadheads or large logs that came off of a boom or a shipping container or, so forth, or a, a shipping boat, um, that they can damage a vessel. Cleanup costs, so in many cases, cleanups are done by volunteers, but like you guys did last week, but um, there's a cost to removal uh, and figuring out if you're not making art, how to dispose of that stuff. Um, loss of ecological services. Um, for the fishing industry, they're really annoyed by this um, because they lose their gear, it gets entangled. Um, motors, uh, propellers can also get wrapped up. Loss of tourist dollars, and then the open question, which is human health. So to bring it, oh, I do have an estimate here. $13 billion annually is the estimate of the cost of marine debris in the environment. Uh, but that's definitely not accounting for potential human health. So hopefully I've convinced you uh, that plastic's a problem, <laughs> not only maybe in the marine environment, but in the entire um, waste stream and, and our consumptive habits. Uh, but when it comes to studying it, the beach is a really useful place to get a snapshot of not only what's been in the, been in the ocean, been in the marine environment, and then washed up, but also what might be on the way out if it was littered and left behind. And this suite of different things that I've presented up here are really informative for telling us about potential impacts that I described, and then putting together the, the puzzle pieces of where things are coming from. So again, science to action. If we want to inform prevention and management, we've got to understand the quantity, source, location, and impacts. And it needs to be at a, a scale that's relevant enough to take action. So tomorrow we're not going to in, uh, put in place a global ban on plastic, but what can we do here and what information do we have about what's happening here, what the major sources and impacts are to help us make decisions in our communities. That's uh, where COAST is coming from. So again, we're looking at patterns and we're looking at patterns at a local scale, asking 
what, where, when, and how much, where does it come from, and then what are the impacts. And when we layer these things on top of each other, we can make, we can make, we can prioritize decisions and we can inform risk assessment. So what's the worst bad stuff? How do we get rid of it? So here's where I'm telling you, my, this is my soapbox of Coast and, and what we do. Um, so we're a citizen science program based at the University of Washington. Again, it stands for the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team. Started in 1999 uh, with a focus on studying dead seabirds uh, and establishing a baseline, what's normal, and then measuring change against that. Started marine debris in uh, 2013. Um, with a similar view of we need some baseline knowledge about what we see and measuring change against that. Uh, we can evaluate the effects of legislation and prevention and management actions uh, by doing that kind of monitoring. And we work with a whole range of partners. The way it works is folks survey a beach once a month following a protocol. You attend a training for about six hours pick a beach of your choice. Uh, and then we also look at things like how active is the beach, what kind of recreational activities are happening, how, how many people are there, so we can see our more populated beaches, ones that have more or less debris. Do we see more litter uh, or not? So here's, a, here's where we are. We've been, so we started in 2013, I said, but that was the uh, development that happened for over two years of a lot of back and forth with resource managers, subject matter expertise, experts um, who, who study these impacts of marine debris, uh, who wanted us to ask every question under the sun about what's out there. And, um, and then we tested things in the field with volunteers. Uh, and so we have three years of data. And to date, uh, about 150 active participants, and we're focused on um, Washington, both inside waters in Puget Sound and along the outer coast, and northern Oregon. And we're using the outer coast and Puget Sound inside waters as sort of foils to ask questions about source and the processes that lead things to the beach. So it takes some time, uh, anybody that's been in, in monitoring before, to get results uh, from these kinds of projects. And we're just now starting to look at patterns and um, for folks who are interested, if I've put some stuff on the back table there, there are there's a sign up if you want to get our uh, emails or watch our blogs and look for results if you're interested in attending a training. Um, there's a whole bunch of resources back there for you to um, sign up or grab. So attending a training, um, again, it's about six hours. We come to your community. Uh, so I don't know if we have anything on the calendar lo like immediately locally. Uh, the the soonest thing we have, I think, is in Carkeek Park in, in mid-April. But if there's demand, we'll come for it. We arm folks with a protocol and basically all of the materials and education that they need in order to successfully contribute to the program and collect this baseline data about sources, quantities, and impacts. Uh, and I get the key piece is that uh, data are verified. We look at data quality and we analyze it and look for patterns that then can inform decision making, prevention and management. So what does it mean to participate? Two to eight hours after that training once a month, sampling debris, characterizing and photographing it. Any questions about that? So next steps for you, uh, you can sign up for a COS training and learn more about the program and ways of participating. There's a new web, uh, mobile application that Washington DNR launched a few months ago called My Coast. Uh, you can download that and what they're interested in is sightings of large debris. Uh, and 
I heard that during the cleanup last week, there was a lot of little pellets of styrofoam. And the idea here is that if, if things are reported uh, before they start to degrade like that, like large chunks of foam, they'll deploy uh, a rapid response team to clean that stuff up. And they're also looking for hazardous materials like creosote. Uh, and you can also make observations about all kinds of other things. Um, the Washington Coastal Cleanup, which is led by Coast Savers, a nonprofit in Washington, is on April 20th, just coming right up. You sign up for a beach. If you haven't gotten enough of beach cleanups, just making a pitch for them. And then some really basic things that folks can do in their lives, securing your garbage totes, not overfilling them, um, reducing and being mindful of use of plastic, and then, of course, continue learning. And a pitch for regulation here. Uh, this is a study that was done uh, by NOAA in partnership with CSIRO, which is the major science agency of Australia, looking at states that have container leg deposit legislation. So when you return a can or a bottle, you get money for it. So that incentivizes the recycling process. Um, states that have that on their beaches had significantly less of those kinds of containers on their beaches relative to those that don't. So these kinds of things work. The other thing I wanted to point out is that Washington just underwent a process to generate a marine debris action plan. And this was sponsored by the NOAA Marine Debris Program to bring together stakeholders, people active in this area all over the state, um, to basically prioritize actions for research, prevention, and uh, management, where um, basically we made this report, we identified what's already happened and what needs to happen, and how to work together to achieve those goals. And if you're interested in getting involved in any part of this issue, that document is a great resource to see who's doing what and which pieces you might want to engage with. Lastly, all, that, all the science stories that I shared came from a number of different peer-reviewed publications that are the fine print up here. So that's what I've got for today, and thank you. Somebody's got to bring the microphone to you, I think. Thank you. Uh, earlier, you showed a doc that came away from the tsunami that inundated some. To, what was the name of the town? In Tohoku. 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 Yeah. yeah. Uh, or Fukushima is the okay. The Fukushima the, the, uh, meltdown the nuclear, nuclear plant. plant. Yeah, yeah. Was any of that debris that has shown up since you've been with Coast uh, shown to be radioactive? No. Folks that are monitoring that, there's definitely there was concern for that issue. It has been things that washed up were tested. There was no indication of higher than normal levels of radiation. Hmm. Yeah. I okay. think the ocean is such a huge space and it's so dilute over time that um, it, it, it just... Wasn't. Dissipated? Yeah, it dissipated. It wasn't an okay. issue, yeah. Um, so then you mentioned the microfibers. Was it 1,900 parts of uh, uh, each single washing? Of an individual, like a fleece, yeah. A fleece jacket. Uh, each time. 1,900 particles come off of that. Exactly. End up in the, going through the our sewage treatment and then ultimately Straight out, out, yep. out in the water because they don't have filters fine enough. Exactly, and there are, uh, so Patagonia being an environmentally conscious corporation uh, and a major producer of fleece uh, has tried to get ahead of this by promoting filter, aftermarket filters that you can put on your own dryer that will capture that stuff. Um, so that's something folks can look at. So that's good. Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know. Anyway, perhaps you can address this. Is it, are we better off then trying not to wear synthetic clothing or buy synthetic clothing because of, of the process involved in emitting that into the 
ocean environment or or is, is cotton, it's got some other problems got associated with it, that it's highly water intensive and has other pollutive aspects. Do you, do you know by any chance? Uh, I think it probably depends on the metric <laughs> that you're looking, that you're most concerned with. I, don't, I haven't done the calculus of Synthetic which, versus which cotton. material is more or less impactful on, under what um, metrics, but I do think, uh, so being a group that is concerned, especially with climate change, uh, any synthetic material is very carbon uh, intensive, so there's major emissions that result from the production of plastic. And um, so if you take that early part of the plastic phase into account, uh, I would suspect that you, uh, natural materials would, would be a better bet. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Other questions? So dealing with um, plastics in the water is one of the uh, priorities in the governor's uh, agenda. Mm -hmm. Dealing with and is he dealing with you to develop uh, the plan for doing that, or do you know what he has in mind? I don't. I haven't heard anything uh, honestly about that, other than the two pieces of legislation um, that. There's the, there's the statewide bag ban initiative, which, to my knowledge, it passed the House and it's still awaiting um, movement in the Senate. Uh, and then a, uh, an adverti a marketing uh, provision that would uh, create consequences for false advertising of biodegradability, um, so items that uh, maybe break apart faster, but just into smaller pieces of plastic. That, you know, so really, truly defining what degradable means and under what conditions. Um, those are the two things that I'm aware of at the state level. Yeah. Um, I had a question on your uh, first slide about the gyres. Mm -hmm. There was a line that uh, popped out at me. There was quite a bit of text on it, but I did catch this one line and it said, hindered by a stale way of thinking, um, gyre cleanup has been slow to happen, something like that. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Did I get that right? I'm not sure. Was it the big map? I can... It was, yeah. it was the first one with all the different gyres on it, yeah. Yeah, so that, that illustration came from another organization that, okay. yeah, has, they've, they've put yeah. a whole bunch of facts up there or, um, Reactions. So I, on it, to be completely honest, I've never read the whole thing. Okay. <laughs> it's an illustration of where the gyres are, and that's. Uh, but it's interesting to know that that's what you honed in on. Uh, yeah, it just popped right for out. For future years. years. <laughs> there was a stale, uh, I think. Okay. In terms of cleanup, who? The we, given what uh, the statistics I shared about how uh, the volume of stuff that's put out into the environment on an annual basis, until we stop that. Um, I think, and I think really that's where our, our energy needs to be because what's out there, it's so diffuse, it moves, it's teeny weeny, um, developing, you know, over time getting so small we can't even see it. I don't, I, I don't know how we would do that. So. Yeah. But yeah. I'm not a member, but there is a local group I think it's got a long history here, and it's fairly large. Beach watchers, have you? Mm -hmm. Are you aware of them, and are they doing similar type of work? And could they assist your group? Yeah, they. Uh, we we work with them. Uh, basically, they send volunteers to us who are interested in doing this level of monitoring. So uh, they they're now referred to as. The, so there's the Salish Sea Stewards and Sound Water Stewards. Thank you. Yeah, there's a lot of very similar <laughs> names out there. But so Salish is Sea Stewards are uh, the Skagit-based group, and then Sound Water Stewards are the Whidbey Island and Camino Island group. And they both have a mix of opportunities around citizen science and just pure on the ground stewardship. And for their, for their uh, members who are interested in doing a monthly monitoring program, they, they send them our way. So 
Uh, and we, we work with them to do trainings and things like that. Uh, I live in Skyline here on the west side of the island, and it's very windy up at the top of the hill there. And inevitably, Friday, when you put all the cans out, that's the day it gets windy. So <clears throat> yeah. I came up with a great idea. I took an old pair of jeans, and I cut the legs off, and I put drain rock or, or pea gravel inside, sewed the ends up, and then I just lay that on top of each can if it's windy. And when the guy comes, he just picks it up, shakes it a little, falls off, and then he dumps it. <laughs> And he even sometimes puts them back. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, it works really good, and it's, they're all 100% cotton. Yeah, so that's an easy solution. And yeah, they, they don't uh, rot very fast, and so it works really good. And now I see my neighbors are starting to do similar oh, stuff. Oh, that's so, awesome. Yeah. Trend setting. You know, I go around, after the wind, I go around and pick up all the litter around the neighborhood, and they see me. And what I'm finding is they, they I don't guilt trip them, but they kind of guilt trip themselves after a while. Yeah, you're, you're modeling. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> that, that's a great idea. I, there are folks that are uh, um, marketing solutions out there, like you can buy straps to secure the lid and so forth, but I like that kind of DIY version. Yeah, absolutely. I believe you said you've been doing, the coast has been doing um, this for about three years or mm -hmm. so, and you've developed your protocol. Now, it seemed like NOAA was also in the process of developing a protocol. Are, are they like duplicating your work or no. how, yeah. how are you connected with that? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, NOAA actually developed theirs just before we started working on it, um, and theirs was developed to answer how much, get a baseline of how much is out there and out of what materials. Um, and we were coming at it from the angle of sources and impacts, uh, as I laid out. And But when we designed the protocol and as we've continued to iterate, they're intended to be compatible. So the data can be combined and comparable to answer those questions about material and quantity, so a much larger data set uh, for folks that are um, interested in answering those questions. And then for the clues about sources and impacts, they can layer in the coast data. So, uh, so the answer is we're working together pretty finely and they've actually funded us in the last couple of years. So, yeah. But I, the other, I guess the other thing I'll add to that is the activity of participating in those two protocols is somewhat different and it seems to attract different kinds of people because ours is really detail oriented. And so it takes a bit more time and a bit more investment than participating in the NOAA one. So I think there's kind of different ways of um, contributing and participating in these monitoring activities that suit different people's time and interests. So both are good. Yeah. It's my understanding that the plastic breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. Right. Just like rocks have broken down to sand. Is there a hope that someday it'll be at the same danger level as sand is? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, um, I, don't, I don't have hope for that. Uh, I think that we just need, uh, my take is the reconsideration of the way that we use plastic and how we dispose of what we do produce, um, if we dispose of it at all. Um, but I don't think we can remediate what's already out there. Or mitigate, I guess is probably the right word. Questions? One more quick question. About six months or a year ago, someone developed a static system for open water oceans. Is, are you familiar with that and is it working? It, it showed promise, at least I was optimistic. Yeah. Um, so it currently, uh, it has been towed back to 
uh, shore for repairs and kind of uh, it, it's still going through a pilot and trial and error kind of phase and I don't I think that it could hold promise uh, for removal of some portion of what's out there but in terms of the volume and the location of what's in the environment given that a small portions at the surface it's it's also suspended up and down the water column and in the sediment uh, and we're actively contributing at a huge rate and only growing um, my i guess my concern with that uh, initiative is that it's gained a lot of attention and i would hate for us to think that oh we can just clean it up we just have to innovate and and um, invent, and and we'll, we'll we'll find a solution down the road. Um, I think it's clever. Yeah. How many uh, volunteers do you have active in Skagit County? Do you have a sense of uh, relative number? And w well, how many would you like to have here? And where are they active? And where would you like to see people working? That's a great question. Uh, active in Skagit, I would say probably 20 maybe. Um, I can actually pull up, if we have internet access, I could pull up the map and show you guys. But I would, what I would say is that anybody who's interested will take you. <laughs> the more the better for folks that have ever done any kind of science. We're hungry for data uh, and, um, and that kind of engagement. Uh, and no beach is the wrong beach. The way, what we encourage is for folks to take on a place that has meaning to them, is readily accessible, and you're willing to go to once a month. Um, and maybe it's right at your front door. That's the best, right? <laughs> um, and so if you're interested, uh, I'd encourage you to sign the little sheet of paper in the back and we'll follow up with upcoming training opportunities and um, absolutely. And I was curious, do, do you, you mentioned that on some debris you guys do investigations to, you know, find out where it's coming from and so on, but with the lot, all the volunteer activity that happens, does all of that debris get collected and sent to you or does, mm. do <laughs> they just, they, so they're gathering data on it, on data and you get the data, you don't get the debris. Exactly, right? but we do get photographs. Uh, so we have some folks are taking composite images of their loot and we use that to cross verify that the data that's being collected uh, matches our intent so we can provide feedback and help people improve their skills in collecting that data uh, and also evaluate how good it is. Uh, and then also if there are source clues like a foreign language at writing or um, barcodes, then we get close up shots so that we can do that drill down a bit. Yeah. And just the last question I was wondering if um, you've been surprised by anything that you've seen with this monitoring you've been doing now for three years, just in terms of the amount of stuff or the kinds of stuff, or if there is anything that sort of surprised you from the data so far? Yeah. Uh, well, one, the outer coast has a ton of small plastic. So fragments and nurdles are orders of magnitude, orders and orders of magnitude more prevalent than the stuff that we typically notice. Um, but it's really patchy. Like you, you don't walk along the beach necessarily and see it everywhere. You'll see like, okay, this rack line suddenly is just filled with it. Uh, and I think that's the result of uh, storms or other disturbances in the in the disturbances in the force, disturbances in the gyre uh, and onshore winds that that bring those things to us that have just been circling around in that soup for who knows long, how long. Uh, and then in inside waters, we tend to see things that are relatively more intact and um, consumer sized. So just it, it's more of a closed system most of we can probably think of ourselves more as a source than a sink um, than the, the end 
destination of stuff. I mean, it's not that it couldn't come in from the outer coasts. Things do, but the predominant direction of movement is from, from us out. So we see the signal of that, um, which I guess isn't really surprising, but I think it's really interesting. Um, there's definitely been a, a dip in on the outer coast, the amount of things that we're seeing that look tsunami-esque. Um, so I think that the public fervor around that has kind of uh, also waned, but my, I'm hoping that there's still enough interest to stay engaged in this topic. Yeah. Any other last questions? Yes. I was wondering about, um, there's a uh, company that um, uh, it is an initiator on the clear plastic bottles and they have people who make plastic hands and this sort of stuff uh, for people uh, very, they, it's done through a, a computer to make, you know, uh, so people can have cheap hands for that have, um, and oh, this sort of stuff, all the prosthetics and this sort of stuff in that. And um, is that a really good use of repurposing the plastic or you know, I mean, it's a wonderful use, but um, the plastic is still in the environment. Do we want to get rid of it completely? Or? And there are... Uh, and they're making, they're also making, you know, like tables and chairs and all that sort of stuff out of repurposing plastics in that. Yeah, uh, I think there, there are folks on both sides of the issue that would say, some would say we just need a, a circular economy where we don't produce any more plastic, we just recycle it and reuse it um, over and over. Uh, folks who are concerned with plastic, period, um, are more concerned with um, what happens before it even gets to the ocean, the emissions and um, carbon emissions and toxins and all of the things that go into the production of the manufacturing of plastic. Um, I don't feel educated on all of those um, parts of the life cycle to make a, uh, to give an opinion about whether one is better than the other necessarily. Um, but I will say that my shoes are made out of recycled plastic and uh, I think it's better than single use everything for sure. Um, yeah, and, there, and in terms of emissions, Recycling is down here relative to producing new plastic. So. Yeah. All right. So many great questions. Thank you guys. Yeah, this is really great. Let's give Hillary a huge round of applause. Thank you so much, Hillary.